All right, good morning, friends. Um, we, Luke is longer, huh? So those chapters, they take you a while to get through. Um, you know, you probably think Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Wrong. Luke did. Even though he only writes Luke, the Gospel of Luke, according to Luke, and the book of Acts, it's uh, the most amount of writing of the New Testament as far as word count is all done by Luke. So he is the primary contributor to the New Testament, and then Paul, and then others. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll dive in and look at some of the cool stuff in the book of Luke. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for the beautiful weather, and thank you for a place that we can gather and we can open up your word. God, we ask that you would you would open up the eyes of our heart to see your revelation, that we would we would become more familiar and more convicted with who Jesus is, that we would we would see him for who he is, the the Christ, the Messiah who who has accomplished what we never could, and he has come to to rescue us and to offer good news to the poor. God, we are fully dependent on you, and we're so thankful that you, you've you stirred our hearts in, in this way, that for whether it's been the last year or the last few weeks, we've been on this journey together, reading your word in community. So God, continue to shape us and mold us into the image of your Son. We love you, and we need you to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the Gospel of Luke. Luke and Acts, it, it's like a part one, part two part two writing. And and I mentioned it, I think two weeks ago, one of the things that you're trying, that at least scholars are trying to do when they're, they're maybe writing a commentary is they want to know what was the purpose of this writing. So sometimes it's a little hard to determine why was this book written. And, and you know, we talked about that in the Old Testament when we were in Kings versus when we were in Chronicles. They definitely have a different purpose for why they were, they were written. But Luke is very helpful because the very first few uh, sentences tell us why why this book is being written. So this is a little um, author's note, chapter one, the first four verses. In as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word having delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So did you catch the purpose there? So he's writing specifically for this person, Theophilus, which means lover of God. He's writing for Theophilus so that Theophilus, who's uh, uh, clearly heard of the gospel. He's heard of Jesus. He, maybe he's even a, a follower, but he's kind of sitting on the edge where he's like, ah, I just, I don't know about these things. Can I actually trust this? So, so maybe this is removed from Jesus by just a few decades. And, and now Luke is writing so that Theophilus may have certainty concerning the things that he has been taught. So Theophilus has been taught about Jesus. The account of Luke, the gospel according to Luke, is composed and written to give uh, Theophilus certainty about what he has heard. Now, Luke also references other accounts of this, this gospel narrative. He says in the very first sentence, Inasmuch as many have undertaken, many I assume is more than one when he says that. That's, that's what that word means also in Greek. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things, a narrative of the things. So to compose a story of the, of the things that have been accomplished among us. So it's not just the things that happened among us. Something was accomplished. That's the claim of the gospel narratives. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not just saying something happened, but that something was accomplished. So others have written narratives in this way. So that's probably for referring to the book that we call Mark, a book that maybe even we call Matthew. And then there was maybe other traditions that were just kept where, where people were passing on the Jesus tradition. And maybe they had written down a few of his sayings and were passing that around. But remember, think about a quilt. Luke is making a quilt out of pieces of fabric. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So Luke himself, 
he knows the eyewitnesses. He was not one of the 12 uh, disciples. He was not one of Jesus' disciples. He was actually a co-worker of Paul. So we, we encounter him in the book of Acts. And towards the end of the book of Acts, he's, he's along for the journey with Paul. And we'll, you'll see when we're reading the book of Acts, the, the narrative voice will switch to um, a, a first person towards the end where he'll say, we went on to the ship and then we went to Traos. And he's including himself in the story because he's along with the journey. But he wasn't one of those people who were walking with Jesus. But he knew the people who walked with Jesus. He knew the 12 apostles. He knew the many disciples who saw Jesus raised from the grave. So uh, he's com- he's doing this effort as a historian where he's going around and he's not only finding the documents written about Jesus, but also the people who saw Jesus. And he's interviewing them. He's speaking with them. And then he's creating this orderly account so that Theophilus can have certainty concerning the things that he has been taught. Theophilus probably funded this endeavor. It's really expensive just to write in the first century. Um, papyra is, is very expensive, same with ink, and the ability to write and to have a, a someone who is who is trained and skilled enough to actually write uh, not just a letter, but a book this size. It's a really expensive endeavor. So so um, scholars believe that Theophilus was maybe a, a more wealthy person, and he's funding this whole research project of Luke to do. And Luke writes Luke and Acts. So, so quite a big investment that we all benefit from. Someone funding the education uh, and the study of Luke has benefited all of us. So thanks, Theophilus. So... Um, as you were reading, you probably noticed, you're like, wow, I've read all of these stories before. Uh, or as you were reading along, you're like, I actually don't remember this part of the story at all. So Luke is far more detailed. He's including things that just simply are not included in Matthew and in Mark. And, and lots of people point to the reason for that being that he was a physician. So Luke was a, a trained physician. He was a doctor. So he was also a little bit more technical when it comes to um, the practices of, of history and even in the Greek itself. So the entire Old Testament, it's written in Koine Greek, which is um, the common language Greek. It's kind of like the trade language language, like the lower class level. It's the most accessible Greek that there is. That's how God chose to reveal himself in the New Testament in the most accessible way. Um, there's also, uh, there's different forms of Greek that were circulating. So there's classical Greek. That's maybe like what the Odyssey or the Iliad are, are written in. And Luke is a little bit more like classical Greek, because just because he's a little bit more, more trained and, and scholarly in that regard, being a physician. But just because he's um, more technical with details doesn't mean that his focus is merely the recounting of events. He's not just trying to tell you about things that happened. He's trying to tell you about things that were accomplished. So I think sometimes we can go too far and we can say, well, Luke is a really great historian. So if you just want to know like the historic story, just go read Luke. But Luke is brilliant the way he tells his story. And it's so enriched with the Old Testament. But if you don't have eyes to see, you totally miss it. Because remember when we read through Matthew and every time there was an Old Testament quote, it would usually say this was to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah wrote, or this was to fulfill what the prophet Joel wrote. And he tells you, this is fulfilling a scripture. Well, a lot of those same quotes are actually in Luke, but you don't notice them because it's it's just the words that are in the mouth of the characters. So when the angel is talking, uh, he, when he's talking to Mary and when he's talking to um, to Elizabeth and to, to Zachariah, like he's just quoting scripture, but you might not notice it if you you don't have those in mind in the first place. So a lot of the Old Testament quotations are put into the mouth of the characters. So that's the difference when we see um, Matthew, when it says this was to fulfill, and then it has a quotation. That's called a direct quotation. But when it's not a direct quotation like that, when it's just someone saying the words of an Old Testament uh, scripture, that's called an allusion. It's an allusion to an Old Testament text, but if you aren't just enriched in it, you'll totally miss it. So that's just one way that Luke communicates. Uh, I want to look at 
Uh, mainly just like two things. I just think we I, we never have time for what I planned, so I planned very minimally today. I want to talk a little bit about the genealogy and talk a little bit about uh, chapter 9 and the Mount of Transfiguration, and then a little bit about chapter 10 and that whole Satan being thrown down like lightning, because that stuff's pretty cool, right? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, so uh, let's go to, to Luke chapter 11. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Luke chapter uh, 3, All right? Luke 3. Luke 11, what was I thinking? Okay, what can y'all tell me from from your reading when you read through that genealogy? What were some of your thoughts and reflections? Yeah, Daniel? I noticed that this one in the opposite order wasn't Okay, it goes reverse order. It starts with Jesus instead of ending with him. Great question. It's a great question. We'll talk about it. What else did y'all notice? I'm used to just seeing the genealogy start with David. Okay. You know, and this one was interesting when we start back to Noah. I mean, when we start back to Adam. Yeah. Yeah. So I've always uh, wondered what was going on in the first 30 years of Jesus' life. <laughs> yeah, and you get a few details. Right? He's praying in the, in the temple. It's my father's house. He got taken to the temple for his like dedication and circumcision on the eighth day. Mm-hmm. Good Jewish boy. What else did you guys notice about the genealogy? Anything stick out to you? Or you're just like, wow, oh, that was interesting. You guys notice it's longer than in Matthew? It's much longer, like way longer. Um, in Matthew, it starts with Abraham. And then goes to Jesus, when, uh, as Mike said, goes all the way back to Adam. So it's longer. It's definitely longer. But even between Abraham and Jesus, it's longer here. It also traces Jesus' lineage through a different son of David. In the book of Matthew, it's David and then anyone? Care to guess? Solomon, of course, he was the next king. And then from Solomon, it goes through, and it goes through the, the, the lineage of the monarchy all the way to Jesus. But this one, it just totally takes a side cut. You have David here in verse 31, David and his son Nathan. Who the heck is Nathan? You guys remember Nathan? Of course not. The ninth son of David, the no-name Nathan, the one you don't remember. So, so then the rest of the time, it, it's just tracing through like this alternate line of David uh, and all the no-names, the ones who don't have huge status. Uh, it does um, come back together very briefly with Shealtiel and Zerubbabel. They're also mentioned in Matthew. But then the rest of the time, it diverges from the genealogy of Matthew. So this might make your head scratch. Well, what is going on? Did Luke get it wrong? Did Matthew get it wrong? Why would he he do this? Why would he take a different direction to propose the genealogy of Jesus? These are all good questions, ones that we should be thinking about. I mean, is who, it different or is it just more detailed? It's totally different. If you, if you want to, go home this afternoon and just flip back and forth and read them side by side. And what you'll realize is like none of the names are the same. Once you get to David, from, from David all the way to Shealtiel, all those names are different from the book of Matthew. And also after Zerubbabel, from Zerubbabel to Joseph, those names are different except for, I think, one exception in there. So he is clearly, he is still saying, look, Jesus is from the... He's a descendant of David, but he takes an alternate route to get there. It's really interesting. I have a quick question for you, Sean. Yeah. The the one one previous teaching you gave us that you you cited that from Abraham, David, there were 14 generations, and Mm -hmm. from David to Jesus, there were 14 generations. Yep. I was wondering if that's true before Abraham. Uh, Well... We'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you remember, when we were going through Matthew, um, Matthew intentionally left out, uh, I think it was three names in between David and exile. And we know that because we have the book of Chronicles. And Matthew knows that because he has the book of Chronicles. And he was intentionally designing it to have three sections of 14, from Abraham to David, 14. 
from David to exile, 14. From exile to Jesus, 14. It's an intentional design. Now, there's also, uh, I think, an intentional design here. Maybe not. Maybe this is just the way God providentially ordered it. But Luke is definitely keying in on it, and he's definitely emphasizing it. Um, If we wanted to count from Jesus all the way to Adam, there are 77 names. What is 77 divided by 7? 11. So we have 11 sets of 7. And 7 is a very important biblical number. So the number of completions. So, and it, it's starting with Jesus himself, and it's tracing back. So, so Jesus is the emphasis of this entire thing. Um, but if we were to reverse engineer it, we would start with Adam. 7 from Adam is Enoch. We remember him from our book of Genesis. And then uh, another seven, we get to Shelah. And then another seven, we get to Abraham. Was Abraham important? Yeah. Hey, was Enoch important? Remember, he walked with the Lord. He was taken up and didn't taste death. There was all that, that, that weird little detail in Genesis chapter five. You're like, whoa, this guy's righteous and he walks with God. Well, then there's Abraham. He's one of the, uh, another interval of seven. He's the third seven. And to him was given this promise of blessing to all the families of the earth. Another seven, the fourth seven is Admin. And then the fifth seven is David. So David lands on a seven as well. Then we're tracing through an alternate lineage of, of David. And we get to Joseph. And Joseph then has Joshua, which in Greek is Jesus, which we translate as Jesus. Huh? And then we're going to have another Joseph and another Jesus on the cycles of seven. So uh, this Joshua in verse 29, this is the seventh seven, seventh cycle of seven. So you have seven sevens uh, or 49. Is 49 an important number in my Bible or seven cycles of seven? Yeah. Jubilee. Remember your devotions in the morning in the book of Leviticus? There was all that stuff in the book of Leviticus about Sabbath and about how every seven years you'd give your land rest, but then every seven sevens, every 49 years, it would lead to the year of Jubilee when God's people would release all people of their debts, of their slavery, they would give back land, and it'd be like a, a reset of liberation. You know who's going to be the 7-7? Seven, seven? It's going to be a Jesus, a Jesus, but not this one. It's going to be a different one. So then another cycle of seven, the eighth seven is Shealtiel. Is Shealtiel important? Of course, because the son of Shealtiel, remember from Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Shealtiel, Zerubbabel, is going to be a signet sign for the coming kingdom of God. Then another cycle of seven, you get to Matthias, and then you get another Joseph, and then you get to Jesus. So there's 11 cycles of seven. Uh, I have some notes on my phone. Let me just open them real quick. Okay, so um, one thing that's going on in the intertestamental period, just throw that around at the next dinner party. It's It's a good one. Intertestamental period. So between the Testaments, Old Testament, New Testament. So basically we're saying from about 350 BC to about 30 AD to when Jesus showed up on the scene. That period, there was still lots of Jewish writings being produced. Um, and, and those are contained in what you might know as, as the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha contains a lot of these writings. Books like Enoch, they're not inspired scripture, but they're just Jewish writings that were being circulated around that time and were, were valuable to the people. Well, one of those, uh, Second Estras, it gives like an insight into just the Jewish world and the Jewish thought. And there was this, this Jewish understanding around the first century that all of human history was divided up into 12 segments of times, or to 12 weeks, as it were. And the 12th one, this is, this is on 2nd Estra 1411, if you want to look it up later. Don't actually, it's, it'll put you to sleep, it's so weird. But anyway, so there's 11 weeks, and then all that culminates into the 12th week, which is the Messianic age. 
Uh, they're all waiting for the Messiah to come, for the Messianic age to arrive for the people and for God to reign on earth as he is in heaven. That's what they're waiting for, and that's going to be the 12th week. So there's this Midrashic tradition circulating in the first century that has this idea. And the way Luke presents Jesus is that he is the end of the 11th and the star of the 12th. Because if you counted God's name in it, there's actually 78 names, which means Jesus' name would be the first one of cycle 12, the Messianic age. Or that he is the end of the 11th week, the 11th uh, time zone, which means it's like now or never. Remember that parable he tells of the 11th hour workers where they get to come in in the 11th hour and they receive all the payment of someone who was there the entire time, even though they do like no work, 11th hour. Here it is. So Jesus is here. He's arrived at the Messianic age. So I I think um, some of the intentional things that Luke is doing with the inclusion of 77 names and starting with Jesus, I, I, I think he's one wanting to put focus on Jesus rather than Matthew's focus on Abraham and David being fulfilled through Jesus. So here the focus is Jesus. And what is Jesus? He is a fulfillment of Adam. He's going to be a new Adam. So all of humanity's story is wrapped up in Jesus. He's going to bring about the year of Jubilee for God's people. And he is bringing about the Messianic age. I think that's where some of the things that Luke is driving towards. Another reason why um, it's probable that he traces through Nathan instead of going through Solomon and then all the kings. like He just leaves out all the kings besides David. In Jeremiah 36, 30, I'll I'll go there so that we can all see it together. Jeremiah 36, 30, there's this prophecy. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit on the throne of David and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of day and the frost of night. And again, there's Jeremiah 22, 30. This is, again, about Jehoiakim. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. So these prophecies about Jehoiakim, they're, they're about just like his, his generation of kids. Um, but I think maybe one of the reasons why, why Luke sidesteps Solomon, because the genealogy in Matthew goes through Jehoiakim. And there's this prophecy that none of the, the offspring of Jehoiakim will sit on the throne. Well, what if someone were, were to say, oh, Jesus can't be the Messiah because he's a descendant of Jehoiakim. Well, he's also not a descendant of Jehoiakim. So Luke can sidestep that and, and say, say, even if someone brought up that prophecy, that's not, that's not a, a rebuttal against Jesus's messiahship and his kingship because he's also a descendant not through Jehoiakim. So there's many things going on in this genealogy, but it's really cool, huh? But who would know when you read the genealogy, you're like, oh my gosh, what a slog fest. I've been falling asleep trying to get through this. And I just feel silly because I can't pronounce these names either. So say that again. Because I heard it both ways, that he was and was not. He is a descendant of Jehoiakim. But I believe that those prophecies are just about his immediate children. So Jehoiakim gets exiled and his children don't sit on the throne because they're in exile. But if someone were to not be, you know, pro-Jesus, maybe one of the Jewish religious leaders, what if someone showed up and said, no, 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 he cannot be the Messiah because he's a descendant of Jehoiakim. Well, Luke would say, well, he's also not a descendant of Jehoiakim because he's a descendant through this line of David. So he can sit on the throne. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't remove his messiahship. Yeah. That's just like a proposed hypothesis for why, for why he traces it through Nathan. Uh, another one might be that, that Luke is, is very focused on Jesus's ministry to the poor to the the lowly in society. Poor not meaning um, financially bankrupt. Poor meaning uh, a spiritual outsider, a Gentile, a tax collector, a prostitute, someone who is actually very wealthy but is not associated with the covenant people. So it's not poor financially, it's, it's poor spiritually that there's a focus on. But all of this 
picks up with Jesus's announcement of his ministry. His first words, he goes into his hometown. This is in in Luke chapter four. He goes and he's given the scroll of Isaiah and he opens it up and he finds the place where it was written. He intentionally finds a specific place and he found the place that we call Isaiah 62. And then he reads it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me or he has messiahed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Jubilee. That's what Jubilee is right there. And recovering the sight of the blind. And to set liberty or Jubilee for those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee. It's all a quote from from Isaiah 62. And he actually leaves out one line. If we were to jump there. Isaiah 62. Oh, 61. I'm sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Kathleen. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and then here's the line he left out, and the day of vengeance of our God. See that? He, just, he left out this line. Like, that's the one little section, and yet he stopped it, and he didn't read about the day of the Lord the day when God deals justice for all humanity. Because that's going to happen when Jesus returns. So his ministry is divided. His first coming and his second coming, they've they've been divided in this way where where first he comes bringing a message of forgiveness for all. Think about John. Uh, In John, he said, I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. The world's already condemned. But when he returns a second time, that's going to be it. He's going to to come and he's going to bring justice and judgment on all. And someone will either be in Christ in which their judgment day was moved to the past, or they will be standing on their own righteousness, in which case they will face the justice and the wrath of God. They will face the day of vengeance of our God. So that's how Jesus starts his ministry. And, and, And Luke's putting that before us because this is the emphasis of the gospel of Luke and Acts is that Finally, the true jubilee has come. The true Sabbath has come. So that's another reason why I think um, in the genealogy, that's one of the things that's driving towards is this. Also, you have three stories back to back about Jesus being uh, the son of God. So you have his his baptism right before the genealogy. And and the baptism is God's affirmation. on The voice comes out and he says, you are my beloved son. Jesus is the son of God. We see that in the baptism. And the very next section of scripture is this genealogy, which culminates, goes all the way back to Adam, who is the son of God. So if this is Jesus's lineage, who is Jesus? He is the son of God. And then we have the temptation in the wilderness and the core question in verse three that the devil uh, puts as a proposition. He says, he says, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. So it's just all this discourse. Is Jesus the son of God? Is Jesus the son of God? Yes, yes, yes. Luke shows you that he is the true son of God in the baptism, then in the genealogy, and then in his his defeat of the temptation of the devil. He overcomes the temptation. So all these ways, they're showing Jesus as the true son of God, bringing jubilee to the people. Cool stuff? Yeah, I think it's cool. All right, questions on that before we we move on to Luke 9. Okay, Luke 9. All right, we're going to look at the transfiguration starting in verse 28. Whenever you see little time markers in the Bible, you should at least be like, oh, what does that mean? You know, or why, why tell me about the time? Sometimes you're just telling you about time. But other times I think it's just a good like head scratcher to think about. Now, about eight days after these sayings, eight days. So, well, we don't actually know what day those sayings were taking place on. But we just know eight days after. And remember in the end of the Gospel of John how it's, 
Eight days after these things, Jesus appeared to the disciples. Eight days after these things, Jesus appeared. So if you were to count in a week, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seven, seventh day is the Sabbath. So the eighth day is the first day of a new week, of a new start, of a new creation. So, so here on the eighth day, and which is also the, the day of the week that Jesus rose from the grave, the first day, the eighth day, all those sync up. It's kind of like a scale. Yeah, if you play the eight, you're also playing. I just lost everyone. Okay. You, some of you know. Some of you know. Okay. So just, just think, okay, well, this story is taking place on the first day, like a, a first day of the week type of thing, which is similar to Jesus's resurrection day of the week. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. You guys remember anyone whose face was altered? Moses. Moses. And when did that happen? Up on the mountain. Up on the mountain when he was talking to God. So now all of a sudden Jesus' face is changing. And you're like, oh yeah, like Moses. It's crazy. And his clothes, his clothing became dazzling white. Or as, as Mark says, so white to where no one could bleach it. You're like, nice, go on. No one could bleach it this white. But his clothes are shining. What, why is it always the emphasis on the clothes? It's only in Luke that brings focus to his actual appearance, like his actual skin. Think about that. It's always the clothing. Because it's hard to get things dazzling and white. It's almost impossible. <laughs> okay. okay. The power of God. He can remove any stain. <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. All the way back in Exodus, when Moses is up on a mountain and he's receiving the instructions of God, he's receiving the blueprint for the tabernacle. Here's how you're going to make it. Remember, he's receiving all this stuff. Then he comes down the mountain and they're worshiping a golden calf and he breaks the tablets. He's like, what are you guys doing? It's crazy. But then afterwards, they build it and you have all the detail again of them actually building the tabernacle. Well, in Exodus 28... While he's receiving the plans of, uh, of the tabernacle, he receives the quote-unquote blueprints for the high priest. And the high priest is going to be wearing these, these clothes and the, this dress that's covered in jewels, like gold and shining gemstones, like 12 gemstones on the chest plate, and then, then gold and gems on the, the, the thumims that sit on the shoulder. And on one side, they have six of the 12 tribes written, and on the other side, six of the 12 tribes. And they have the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes. And think about if the sun hit this guy. He would just be shining. And remember, Moses is on a mountain, and he's receiving the pattern, the heavenly pattern, for the earthly reality, which means that the high priest also is supposed to reflect a heavenly reality. And and think about the way God is described when he appears in the beginning of Ezekiel. Fire, bronze, or when he shows up as the Ancient of Days in the book of Daniel, and he's like blazing of glory, and there's lightning coming out of him. He's flashing. The high priest is an earthly model of a heavenly reality of the true high priest of God himself, Jesus Christ. So every on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's showing his true nature and he begins to shine. But it's like you're seeing the real high priest all of a sudden because he is shining in glory. And notice the word glory appears multiple times. Glory, glory. And then there's going to be this overshadowing. So his appearance changed. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Come back to that. Which he was about to accomplish. Remember why Luke is writing? To recount all that was, has been accomplished among us. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. And the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Because remember the last time the glory of God appeared on a mountain? 
they made a tent afterwards so that God could dwell in the midst of his people. Like Peter's just like, oh yeah, like, I know my Old Testament. I know what we do. Like, I think this is what we're supposed to do next. We're supposed to build a tent, but I don't really know. And look, it says, not knowing what he was saying. Like he's just like stumbling over his words. First thing that comes to mind. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And where are they? They're on a mountain. And a cloud comes onto the mountain, just like in the book of Exodus. A, mountain, a cloud comes down. And in the book of Exodus, when that cloud came down, what did God then do with the people? He made something. He made a covenant. He came down in the cloud of glory. There was lightning. And it was dazzling light. And then God invited the people into a covenant relationship. And now Peter, James, and John are experiencing the same reality, but they're experiencing it with Jesus. The cloud came down and overshadowed them, and they were afraid. This is terrifying. They're not like, this is nice. I'm really enjoying this experience. They're afraid. And they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son from Psalm 2 about the Messiah. My chosen one is from Isaiah 42. Listen to him. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. This little phrase, listen to him, is from Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses speaking. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Listen to him. So God is affirming, this is the prophet like Moses that we've been waiting for. Here he is, and he's more glorious than you could ever imagine. He's the one who truly reveals God. So you have this mention, uh, if you watch the Bible Project video, they already pointed this out to you. Um, they're, they're standing and they're, they're talking to him about what he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And they spoke of his departure. And I have a footnote. So maybe some of you have a footnote for that word departure. Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. If you look down, so at the bottom of your Bible, there'll be little footnotes and maybe like a little number by it like mine. It's the Greek word exodus. Exodus. Departure. He's about, so Moses and Elijah, they appear in glory and they spoke of his exodus that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Tell, someone tell me the Exodus story. <clears throat> you don't have to tell, tell me about the tabernacle designs. Tell me about like chapters 1 through 15. Bennett, thanks for volunteering, man. Uh, God told his people not to go to Egypt. They went to Egypt and became a lot of big people. Mm -hmm. Egypt got scared. Uh, enslaved them so that they would not take over. Uh, they got bigger. Egypt got more scared and started killing their uh, children. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Moses had been born, delivered, killed an Egyptian, fled for 40 years. God told Moses to go to Egypt. Moses said no. God said yes. Moses went to Egypt. Um, God did 10 miracles that spit on Egyptian gods. Yeah. Eventually killed all of Egyptians firstborn, which was awesome. That's what they did to God's people. Took them out of there, went through the Red Sea. The Red Sea swallowed up the Egyptians. Um, and then they're out in the desert. Nice. Great job. Great recap. Thanks. Snap it up for Ben. And and how come how come God didn't kill the firstborn of the Israelites? Because they had a Passover lamb that was covering them. Exactly. Not just because God was like, I just won't kill you guys. Because they were covered by a Passover. So all this should be in our minds when we think, when we hear the word Exodus. Oh yeah, that story about an enslaved people who were set free from captivity. Oh yeah, that story about a people who were redeemed by the blood of a lamb. They were purchased out of slavery and they were kept alive through the covering of a lamb. Oh yeah, that story about a people who go through the Red Sea because of God's miraculous salvation to then enter into a covenant with God. What is Jesus going to accomplish in Jerusalem? All of that. The people who are bound, we are not slaves 
to Egypt. We are slaves to our sin. And Jesus is going to accomplish something in Jerusalem that is going to set us free from the slavery that we have in sin. Not only is he going to do that, he's actually going to bring us through the waters of death through his outstretched arms and to bring us into a new covenant. Uh, and how is he going to do all this? How come we don't die? Because we have his blood painted over us and he is our Passover lamb. So this is the anticipation. This is what Jesus is accomplishing. This is what Luke is writing about. And one of the ways that author Luke puts this in front of us is just with a single word. Just throws it out there and it's supposed to bring all this to memory. You know, it'd be like saying the Constitution. And like you, all of you have these preloaded ideas about what the Constitution is, what the Constitution means for people, what it means to protect it, what it means to, to disregard it. And we have all these ideas in it. Or, or to say, Luke, I am your father. Boom. Just the entire Star Wars narrative just like came into your guys' mind from one little phrase. And that's how Luke is communicating as well. The reason why it's Moses and Elijah. Yeah. Why, why, why these guys? Moses is the representative figure of the Torah. The first five books of the Bible. So um, sometimes instead of saying the law, sometimes people will say according to Moses or the books of Moses. Well, Elijah is the representative figure of the prophets, the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Kings, uh, Samuel, Kings, and then also the latter prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, all, all those books. They're, they're thought of as the prophetic books. And Elijah is the representative figure of those books. So it's like you have on this mountain, the law and the prophets bearing witness to Christ. Yeah? It's like all of scripture is bearing witness to Christ. And that's why when we get to the end of Luke, Luke 24, Jesus is going to say, uh, stuff like this. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Or again, he's going to say uh, in, in verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. But that's a little summary of what he said in verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, the third category of scripture, must be fulfilled. Or what Paul says in, in Romans uh, 3.21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets testify or bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Or what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 14 and 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, with the Old Testament, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Point of the Old Testament is Jesus. He's the point. Or as Jesus himself said in uh, John chapter 5, you search the scriptures. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness or testify to me. And yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And, and then again in verse 46. For if you believed Moses, if you, friends, if you believed the first five books of your Bible, if that's all you had, if you believed the first five books of the Bible, you would believe in Jesus. Because Moses wrote about him. At least according to Jesus, right? And who, who do we trust and follow? That's what the Old Testament's about. So Moses and Elijah bearing witness to the Exodus that Jesus was going to accomplish, both in person and in writing. They bear witness. Questions on that? That was crazy, right? Whoa. <laughs> okay, let's go to Luke 10. If you thought we'd gotten crazy so far, just wait until this one. We're about to get crazy. <laughs> Come on, guys, where's the energy? <laughs> this is gold. <laughs> All right. 
So in, ver- in chapter 9, you have the sending of the 12, who are also 12 apostles, and they're sent out. Now we have the sending of uh, the 70 or the 72. Uh, after this, the Lord appointed, mine says 72. Raise your hand if your translation says 72 in verse 1. Okay, now raise your hand if your, your verse says 70 in your translation. Ah. With a footnote. That it With a footnote. <laughs> yeah, mine has a footnote too. So what's going on? Is it 70 or is it 72? Which one is right? How come our Bibles disagree? Can we not trust our Bibles? Right? That's like the atheist is like, oh, you can't. There's, there's discrepancies in your Bible. You can't trust. It's like, oh, okay. Well, we all have footnotes that say or the other number. So there's two text traditions that are, are both really reliable, that both testify to these different numbers of whether or not it's 70 or 72. I think at the end of the day, whether it was 72 or 70, it's driving towards the same, the same idea. Um, but we're going to talk about that in a second. So the 72 or 70 come, and they sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place, that he himself was about to go. So these are like little, they're little duos, forerunners. So it'd be like, if a, hey, hey, Mike and Kathleen, I'm going to play the drums this morning. But first, could you go in and make sure everything's prepared for me? Cool. And then I'll, I'll show up. Like that's what's going on. He's sending out these 72 in these pairs and they're forerunners to prepare the way. They're like getting to do what John the Baptist was doing. So they're going to go out and he tells them, I'm sending you where there's wolves. You might get devoured. Don't take money with you. Don't take protection with you, but rely fully on the kindness of other people. And when they receive you, they're receiving me. It's just awesome. Awesome little note. Then he talks about uh, some cities uh, that are, are modern day cities. And he says, you know, your rejection of me, it's going to make it worse for you than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah or for Tyre and Sidon. You know, those Old Testament cities that got destroyed by God's wrath. Sodom and Gomorrah, like hellfire from the heavens being poured out, sulfur and fire, boom, destroying the entire city. It's going to be worse for those who reject Christ. That's scary. Very intense, Jesus. Very intense. And then the 72 come back. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. End of story. And then he like prays and then it just keeps going. All right, so the 70 or the 72. When I, when I read that, I think about... You know, just all the miracles, all the things that people saw, and they talked about it and told it, and they told it, and they told it, and they told it. You know? mm-hmm. Here we are. Yeah. 2,000 years later. Uh, do you remember the number 70 ever showing up in your Bible? That was the days that, uh, for 70 years, was the time that they had to be in exile. Of exile, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's one reference. It's going. I'm about to take you on a journey. All right, put your seatbelts on, get your notebooks out. We're not going to count, but if we did, the table of nations, Genesis chapter 10. How many nations do you think there are? 70. 70. <laughs> There's 70 nations. 70 nations all representative of God's people. He, he divides them. He scatters them all because of the stuff that happened at the Tower of Babel. And there's these 70 nations. And out of those 70 nations, he chose one. This guy, Abram, that he grew up into a, a family and then a nation called Israel. So there's 70 nations in the table of nations. In the Greek translation, the LXX, there's 72. Okay. Ooh, so it's like a recommissioning of of humanity maybe going on in in Luke chapter 10. So there's that. There's 70 there. And then I know you all remember this, but let's just go there just because in uh, Genesis chapter 46, 
Um, Joseph, you know, he's, he's in charge of all of Egypt and his, his dear old dad is alive. He says, come on down to Egypt where there's food, bring the whole family. It's great. So they all start coming down and, and they're just like listing the people. There's this many people, this many people, this many people. And then you get down to verse 25. These are the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, seven persons of all. All the persons belonging to Jacob, who's renamed Israel, who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. Come now. It's like a new humanity with Israel. God with Israel, bringing them into Egypt, is establishing a new humanity. Just as in Genesis 10, humanity is composed of these 70 nations. Well, God is forming a new humanity in this covenant people of Israel. At least that's the design of it. Now, if we just want to be super technical, the not included in that 70 is the two sons of Joseph who are already in Egypt. And if you added them, you get 72. Okay. But wait, there's more. Okay. If we wanted to go to Exodus, we have a repetition of, of these numbers. Um, in verse 4, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Verse 5, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. And his two sons join. They become tribes, half tribes. So it would be 72 if you wanted to add them. Okay. All the way back in Genesis chapter 10 and 11. There's the Tower of Babel, and God scatters the people. All the nations, these, these quote-unquote 70 nations, are scattered across the world. But something else happened in that, that event. In Deuteronomy 33, 33, 8, 32, 8. Yes, this is a reference to that story. When the Most High God gave to the nations their inheritance and divided mankind. He fixed borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, the divine beings, you know, like Baal and Asherah. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob was his allotted heritage. So these, these two verses, it's, it's an allusion back to the Tower of Babel story. When God scatters the people, and then he allots their borders, and then he establishes Elohim over them, and he divided them according to how many Elohim, divine beings, these, these under gods, lowercase g gods, and they all have their spot. But God chose his people. He chose Jacob. Because through Jacob, he was going to reclaim all the nations and bring blessing to all the families of the earth. So um, if we were just like to do a bad drawing of what's going on, let me... So we just have, like, have this grid going on. And in the middle of that grid, let me make it so you can see these. You have Israel. And this one belongs to Yahweh. But then you have all, all these other nations around them. Like you have, you have the Philistines. You have Babylon. You have Assyria, and they also have their gods. And it's been allotted and portioned. And God, through Israel, is going to make them a holy nation, a royal priesthood, to bring blessing to all the families of the earth. And how, how did Israel do at it? Really, really bad. <laughs> they fail. So that's why Jesus shows up, and he gathers 12 apostles, because he's the true Israel. He's the true Israel who's going to bring this blessing into order. But then in Luke chapter 10, what he does is he gathers 70 or 72 disciples and he sends them out 
It's as if they're going to the nations. So what happens is these other nations, Babylon, they, Babylon has their own God over them. Assyria has their own God over them. Israel has their God, Yahweh. That's who they're supposed to serve. Yeah, question. Are those other gods a part of the idea of the Elohim? Yes. Yeah, the divine, the divine council. They're not a part of God himself, um, but just like we're all humans. We're all humans here, but Jesus is, is the true human. He's a true human one. Um, I mean, he's the pinnacle of it. So God is the God of gods. He's the uncreated God. He's the one who creates all things. So every spiritual being, God created them just like God created us. And just like God gave us uh, responsibility to rule over his creation and and uh, and bring it to to, uh, to subdue it, bring flourishing, you know, guard and keep the garden, that kind of stuff. Um, so also they were given responsibilities and some of them rebel from God causing a divine rebellion also with the earthly rebellion. But they are gods. And are those Elohim real, real, active as in? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, otherwise, I think there's just verses in the Bible that would be like, well, if they're not real, it'd be like comparing God to SpongeBob, who's not real. It's like, it would make no sense. God has authority over them. He has control over them. He's going to judge them. The lake of fire is made for their rebellion, uh, not for sinful humans. Sinful humans who do not repent, they go there, but the, the lake of fire is prepared for Satan and his angels. So I think they're real. I think they have real influence. I think that what these texts are about, and also in Acts 17, is that they're real. And what God is accomplishing in Jesus is these allotted boundaries, he's tearing them down. And he's reclaiming all humanity in Jesus. Now, what kind of power do they have? Nothing compared to Jesus. I mean, they try to, they show, Jesus shows up and they're like, what have you to do with us, son of the most high God? And when Jesus says something, they do it. They're, they're locally specific. They don't get to be omnipresent like God. They're not omniscient like God. They're not omnipotent like God. Um, they're probably a little bit more like us, except for in a spiritual realm, but they can influence us a little bit. We can influence them. And we saw that all the way back in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve were told to rule over creation and to subdue it. And then this little spiritual creature shows up. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to subdue it. But instead, they gave it some power. And they listened to it instead. So the way they gave this spiritual being power over them is they just listened to it. And that's how we hand over our power to spiritual evils, is we listen to the lie of sin and the lie of evil rather than listening to God himself. Daniel, you have a question? It also seems like that part is exposed. Well, not. They always seem to be mistaken. Exactly. It's like angels. These aren't angels, though. Yeah. Angels are, are different. So, Sean, the 12 uh, disciples were meant to represent the 12 tribes which did not accomplish what God had mm -hmm. wanted them to accomplish. Yep. Yeah. And they were, when there were idols, Mm-hmm. This is a different, this is a, a future time, and now they're gods who are being worshipped. Idols, so... Is that a silly question? Um, no, I don't think it's a silly question. So, um, you know, the Philistines, they have Dagon, and he's like half fish, half human. Right. And they, have the, they have an idol statue, but the... The statue or the image is the is earthly God? is the earthly representation and embodiment of the divine or heavenly reality. And Yahweh has that too. Look, I'm looking at 30 of them right now. We are all made in the image of God. We're, we're, it's the word selim. It's the word for like an idol statue in a temple. That's why we're not supposed to make images of God. He's already made them. They're you and I. So... Now, now back to Luke, because we are getting low on our time. He sends out the 72. The 72 return, and they are astonished. They say, even the demons, even the rebellious spiritual beings, they listen to us. In other words, they're able to cross borders and reclaim humans that are enslaved in sin and demonic powers because Jesus has broken down those borders. He is reclaiming all of humanity. 
That's why Jesus says this. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You know, Satan has been overthrown. Now, no holds bar. You can go to any people, any nation, any tongue, any tribe, and you can reclaim them in the name of Jesus. God is taking his humans back, his image bears. Um, this is also picked up in Acts 17, when Paul is at the Areopagus. He says, in, starting in verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made, God made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. So the, the allotted portions of the nations. That they should seek God. The purpose of God scattering the nations was so that they would seek God himself and perhaps feel their way towards him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art of the imagination of man. The times of ignorance of God that God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed. So there was a time where the nations were divided and they were allotted to their boundaries that God designed. And he looked over former ignorance, hoping that they would find their way to God. But now, no more times of ignorance. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent because there's going to be a day of judgment. So what Jesus accomplished in Jerusalem is the liberation of the captive. He's setting free the captive. All of us, we're captives to, to spiritual realities, our own sin, and our own fleshly desires. All these things we were enslaved to. And this is what Jesus is releasing us from on the cross. But he does so by sending messengers to us to share the gospel with us. And there, there's nowhere that the gospel cannot go. You're not limited in where you can take the gospel now to set someone free. I saw a hand. Yeah, I just, would you say that there were like two distinct programs going on where before God was willing to overlook this ignorance and now he's no longer, there's a new program that has been initiated? Yeah, I wouldn't use the word program. Um, because even in the Old Testament, I, I think the way someone was was saved or brought into covenant was still through um, through the the means of Israel and God's program, Yahweh's program with them. We see that with Rahab. We see that with Ruth. Um, but I think what it means of the overlooking ignorance is also what uh, Paul mentions in Romans chapter two that it it's God's long bearing patience with sin not to bring judgment. That's what his is overlooking is that he's not uh, he's not just bringing judgment right away on them. He's allowing there to be this time where it seems like sin multiplies, and the reason why is because called God's kindness is meant to bring us to repentance. But always uh, is the always the way to relationship with God has been um, through the covenant promises that God makes. Ruth, Rahab, Abraham himself was not an Israelite. Stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. All the way back, 70 or 72, what's going on? <laughs> you know, Luke could have just said, hey, he sent out a lot of people. I think he gives us this detail for a few reasons. One, Jesus probably actually just sent out 70 or 72. But I think Jesus is being purposeful um, to make a statement that he is reclaiming the earth. The earth. Which means that there are still people who have not heard the gospel, whether it's our neighbors or people in an unreached people group that need to hear the gospel. And the only way they will be saved is if we take the gospel to them. But Jesus has done the work to bring down the borders to where we can actually go to them. So we have to go. That is the uh, first half of the book of Luke.
We'll talk a little bit more about it next week. Let me pray for us. I'll stick around for a little bit, and then we'll go worship. Jesus, thank you that on the cross, you accomplished something far greater than we often perceive or imagine. Not only did you, you conquer our sin and death, but you, you brought down the powers that separated us from access to you. God, there is nothing that can hinder us from going to someone else and bringing the gospel to them. And God, in your wisdom and sovereignty, you can regenerate hearts and give eyes to see and ears to hear. And you can call people out of darkness. And, and God, by your mercy, we get to partner with you in that. So God, stir in our hearts a, a desire to be sent. We, we don't want to just be sent. We want to be sent with desire and passion for those around us, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, and those who we have not known and do not see halfway around the world. God, thank you for accomplishing a greater exodus in the person of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And thank you for, for calling us out of our Egypt and through our Red Sea. God, we love you and we need you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.